Words have power. <laughs> Words mean everything. Human beings have a need for communicate, to, to communicate. We don't always, have, don't always have something important to say, but we talk quite a bit anyway. Nearly all the time, the world runs on communication. Communication is behind most of the media stuff, the internet, is communications. Corporations, governments, families are communication systems that enable people to work together. If we visit each other and there isn't some kind of dialogue going on, we, we get uncomfortable real fast. They say when you're fully comfortable with somebody, you don't need to say anything. But normally, that's not the case. When my girls were younger, they craved communication. After, a spent, after spending all day with their friends in school or whatever, then they'd get on the phone and talk half the night. And when I finally got them off the phone, they had the computers, they had the internet, and uh, they could get online and communicate with a half a dozen friends at the same time. And uh, until I finally made them go to bed. Well, you wouldn't believe the content, the content of their conversations, or lack of it. <laughs> it, it sorry. <laughs> and it, it wasn't exactly what you'd call information that was being passed back and forth. It was just chatter. Probably nothing separates mankind more from the animal world than our ability to understand the symbols necessary to communicate information. And these symbols we call words have power. The ideas and the feelings that are passed from person to person literally run the world. We, we use language to maintain our relationships. Right now we are in the middle, of, well we're not in the middle of the presidential election yet, but it, I guess it started. But it's either won or lost based on their ability to communicate. In companies, performance suffers or improves when people don't, don't talk or when they communicate. So our, wor our words have the power to cause real damage to people or to bring them comfort and blessing. They are powerful. Jesus taught that it isn't just what we say that will form the basis of, well, he said it isn't just what we do that will form the basis of the judgment, but what we say. I tell you on the day of judgment you will give an account for every careless word, because words are important. So we need to be careful in our use of words and use them wisely, because they are a window to the soul. Sometimes we don't listen to our own words. Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Whenever we say something, we are revealing what's inside ourselves, what's going on in our minds and our hearts. Maybe if we thought about that, we'd be more careful because people read, read us that way. And of course, James elaborates on this. There must have been some real problems in the early church because James wrote what we, what we would call a blistering letter. And he says this, If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. It would have been nice if he made it a little easier. But that's what it says. So apparently if you can control the tongue, you are in control. And he says the tongue is often out of control. And I don't know anybody who spoke more strongly about our ability to misuse, wor misuse words than James. And he says, the tongue is like a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. But he says no one can tame the tongue. It is an unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. Well, that's what words can do. These sounds that we make are not just vibrations in the, in the air. They, they are the reality that makes the universe function. 
God's words are symbols of His power. You know the, the verses, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of His mouth all their hosts. For He spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. There is power in God's word. Their power in words, they reveal what's inside, but they are the substance that actually shapes the world. And the point James makes is that a person cannot come to church and bless God and then go home and curse his fellow man because out of the same mouth, blessings and curses can't come at the same time. You cannot love God and hate your neighbor is what the, what the basis is. So we need to listen to our own words and be careful in their use. We really don't have to worry about the words too much if we pay attention to what's in the heart because that's what's going to come out one way or another. We, we express ourselves in body language and everything else and people can read us eventually no matter how we choose words to cover it up. And if our hearts are in tune with God's grace, it will find expression. Now most of our words don't do much of anything. They kind of flow out of, out of us like breath and we chatter about our likes and dislikes, about the weather, the sports, politics. And most of it's harmless, it fills the time. But sometimes we say things that are incredibly important. Words that can influence a person for eternity. An encouraging word at the right time. Words that express faith and confidence in each other may be all a person needs to hang in there, to go on. Proverbs 25.11 says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. I read an article about a young woman from Japan named Atsuko Saiki, Saiki or something. <laughs> and all her life she lived in Japan and she you know she knew about the United States and thought it was going to be wonderful and she wanted to come here and go to school and finally she arranged to take go to California and enroll in a university when when she got there she found it wasn't quite up to her dreams <laughs> and she said she found out the people were struggling with the same issues that she did, they did in Japan. They were often tense and besides that she was kind of lonely. She didn't feel like she fit in. Like she was a different culture. It was a different place. She said one of her hardest classes was physical education. She felt that the other students were far better than she and one afternoon the instructor the, the teacher instructed her to serve a volleyball to her teammates and that seems like such a simple thing, but she was terrified of that. She feared humiliation. And I guess that in Japan, that is everything. Um, anyway, a young man sensed her fear. Walked up to her, she, he, she said, he walked up to me and whispered, Come on, you can do this, Atsuko. Simple thing to say. But she says... You will never understand how those words of encouragement made me feel. Just these four words. You can do it. Apparently had an incredible impact on her. She says she felt like crying for happiness. <laughs> you think it's just that easy. Six years later, she still thinks of them when things aren't going well. There's nothing profound in these words. The young man probably didn't had any had didn't have any idea of the impact they had, but it was at the right time, it was the motive behind it. Here was one person who expressed belief and confidence in her. He essentially told her that he wasn't waiting for her to mess up so she he could make fun of her. He was supporting her, and it worked wonders. Well, you could think what else he could have said. What's the matter with you? What are you afraid of? Grow up. What, you know, he, he could have destroyed her on the spot. 
We do it all the time. But he apparently sensed her apprehension, may have known that in her culture, in her culture, humiliation is the most dreaded thing you can face. You know, in, in Japan they commit Harry Carry if rather than face humiliation on an occasion they still do. So words can be uplifting, words can be cruel. And how how many times would you just like to take them back? How many times do we wish we'd kept our mouth shut? But you know, once they're out, it's done. Jesus pointed to the reality behind our words. He said, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for the tree is recognized by its fruit. So, it might be good for us to pay attention once in a while to our own words. Think about what people are hearing. What are we actually saying to people? I wonder, I think sometimes we don't know what we're really saying. What do they reveal about what's inside ourselves? Words create, words destroy. It's a part of a godlike power God gave to the human race. The ability to communicate these symbols is a part of the image of God in man. Man made, man made in God's image was given the ability to use words and we need to learn to use them responsibly. The, the right words spoken at the right time can bring light to the eyes according to the Bible. They can make a fa person's face beam or they can tear them down. The wrong words can provoke evil and despair. I talked to a man a few years ago, a church member who, not here, another church, but it could happen here. And he complained to me, he said, my wife, whenever we're in public, my wife makes me look foolish. When she has opportunity, she says she makes me look stupid. And I already knew that because I'd seen her do it. And so now he doesn't want to go to church, and he doesn't want to go to church functions or any social functions. She wonders why he's so antisocial. And when he tries to tell her, she scoffs and said she's only do it, doing it in fun. You know how much damage is done by doing things in fun? I know I've been guilty of it on occasion. You know, she thought it was funny, but it was kind of expensive humor. And if she had examined her heart, she would have known that it wasn't motivated just by humor. And it might have been funny, but you know how we use humor sometimes even to punish. And we know it is too easy for us to be guilty of the same things. I knew, I knew another man who started coming, church, coming to church when his wife stopped going to church. <laughs> I'll tell you more about him, but he was kind of a well-known character in Adventism, and I can't describe the story because you would all probably know him. When his wife wasn't pre present, he was an agreeable, likable person. But his wife was, I don't know, just a sourpuss. And it was unpleasant to be around her. And when she, when she got out of the way, he, he started coming to church. Here's the point of the sermon. Ephesians 4.29 Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs that it might benefit those who listen. If we could all do that, all the time, what would happen? What if our words were to build people up? There would be a whole lot better, our, our marriages would be a whole lot better, I can promise you that. Far more marriages would be suc succeed and homes would be ha a happier place. Church would too. Our words are like weapons 
They are formed to accomplish what our hearts desire. And if we would study our own words, we would know what was in our own hearts. Now Ephesians 4 doesn't stop with that one verse I read. The next verse says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. This is powerful stuff. These are words that does all this. These kinds of words are opposed to the Spirit of God. It says it grieves Him away. So how can we always say the right things? How can we avoid missed opportunities to be, and to be a positive force that can really make a, a positive difference in a person's lives? Well, the answer is very simple. We have to care about each other. Sabbath school we learned that we have to look at other people as better than ourselves. We have to think about what the other person sees, how they feel. We have to care enough about them to pay attention. You don't have to worry too much about what you say as what you think and feel. You know, we're told that feelings can't be controlled and, and uh, that might be true. We may not, may not be able to turn feelings on and off at will, but we can control a, control a number of things that affect how we feel. And some of them are just basic, simple Christian living. The Bible speaks of keeping the heart. Keep the heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put per perverse lips far from you. So the Bible puts these two things together, the heart and the mouth. <laughs> they seem to be connected. So what do you do? You keep the heart and the mouth will follow. So be aware of what's in there. Cultivate the mind to think good things, to listen to people, to pay attention to them, to consider what is going on in their minds. Think good things about each other and believe in each other. Then take care of yourself too. I don't know how you are, but I find out when I've got a sour stomach, it messes up everything else. And so a lot of problems can be solved just simply by living, eating, and sleeping right. When Paul talked about self control, he didn't just go out there, he didn't say out there, just go out there and Exercise your will because you're going to lose. He said, I discipline my body and make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, and I worry about that sometimes. Sometimes I just tell myself when I'm home and trying to behave to practice what I preach. <laughs> but he says, after I've preached to others, I myself will, have, will not be disqualified. And Ellen White wrote, it's impossible for those who indulge the appetite to attain Christian perfection because it affects the mind, it affects the heart. We haven't been giving all this information just so we can live longer, but so we can live better. Its purpose is to aid us in becoming loving, kind, patient people and that will be revealed in our words and our demeanor. So after you've paid attention to what you put in your body, think about what you put in your mind. What do you think about? What do you watch? Read? Listen to? I don't care. Do your thoughts tend toward being sad and morbid? Are you, are you a negative person? Would you describe yourself as harsh and critical? Well, if you want to know the answer to these things, just listen to your own words. You know, people use religion to express what is 
in their own heart by focusing on a few minor things, and Jesus said, and missing the important things of justice and mercy. And they missed the whole entire purpose of the Christian faith. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Do you collect all the problems in the world and in the church and meditate on those things until they get you all upset? Because they will. Or do you pay attention and try to read between the lines and see what God's doing in people's lives and in the church? Because He is working. That's what He does. He hasn't forgotten us. He hasn't abandoned us. He is working. Watch for it. There's some good things to think about. What do you talk about? Well, these things can dominate us. Other people's problems can, can, can occupy our minds. What's the subject of your conversations? Who are you talking about? What are you saying about them? What we need is the gospel of God to sweeten up our lives. And it will if you fill the mind with it. You know, the Apostle Paul had some problems too. You aren't the only one in the world with it. And I mean, I don't know how you would like to be treated like he was, but I think I tend to be discouraged by some of that stuff. He said he wrote about being in great, in, about in great endurance and troubles, hardships, distresses, and beatings, imprisonments, riots, hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. Well, that kind of stuff could sour your life. He was out there preaching what he thought was going to help people. Give them good news. Give them hope. And what did they do? They abused him. And he had other problems. I don't know what they all were, but he prayed about one, th three times he says. He said, I could really do without this. And three times the answer was no. And, and he could have moped about it the rest of his life thinking he couldn't, you know, God, God could take care of this and here I am suffering with it and I'm trying to do his will. And so he said, God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. He said, and Paul says this, he wrote this, Therefore, most gladly will I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What on earth is he talking about? He said, that's why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness and in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Kind of strange. He wasn't going to let a little problem in life poison his spirit. It wasn't worth dwelling on. He was, you know, Paul was one of the most influential people in the history of mankind. You know, you have Moses, and you have, of course, Christ, but and then, and then Paul. Intelligent, educated, brilliant. The man's responsible for changing the history of the world as much as any other figure. Well, you know, that could go to your head as you looked out all the other poor, you know, mortals the lesser lesser people out there. <laughs> Maybe he needed a problem in his life so he could sympathize with somebody else. You know, often the most compassionate, considerate people are those who have suffered the most. They know what it's like so when they meet someone else in the same circumstance, they, can, they know what to say. So Paul says he was given a problem. He had a thorn in the flesh, he called it. A messenger of Satan. And Paul originally thought, well, I'd be better off without that. But God didn't take it away, and he told Paul he had to live with it. And, of course, it was for his own good. In reality, it gave him more power. Because he could sympathize with other people. If he had never suffered, if life was always, if he had a silver spoon in his mouth, mouth, never suffered any difficulty. You 
know humanity doesn't handle that very well. <laughs> kind of goes to our heads. I mean, most of us, if we had a chance to plan our life out ahead of time, <laughs> what would you plan? <laughs> What would you include? What would you exclude? Well, there's probably a lot of things you'd like to get, wish, wished it hadn't happened to you or that you didn't have to go through. And maybe you would, you'd have written a different script than the one you have to live. And so God does it for us. And He knows what is best for us. I mean, I would probably have left a lot of things out of my life, a lot of worries and problems, but... God is much wiser than that. And uh, the question is, what do you do with it? Do you grumble about it? Do you gripe about it? Do you, do, if it doesn't suit your fancy, you, uh, wouldn't it be a lot, lot better off in my life? would be better off if I always had my way? Well, probably none of us, well, none of us do. So what do we do with it? What, how, what do our words reveal that we do, do about it? Do we compl complain about it? Or do we meditate on what God is doing in our lives? And give Him thanks because He is revealing... It's called, it's called a refining process. And so it's not an accident. God is at work. I think people grow up in the world or our society with entirely unreal, unrealistic expectations about life and then they go through life unhappy. When I counsel somebody about getting, you know, getting married, and life is just exciting and they know it's going to be great. Sometimes I tell them to lower their expectations. <laughs> and I'm not saying that because... Marriage isn't a blessing and a great thing. I'm just saying sometimes people have funny ideas about what they're going to get. And so you're looking for the perfect life, the marrying the love of your life, getting the ideal career, never having to worry about money, always being healthy. You know, I got news for you. <laughs> And you know what it is. Life is going to be a struggle no matter where, which direction you take. Christ had to go through suffering. Paul says he himself suffered when he was, he was attempted, when he was tempted. So he's able to help those who are being tempted. So these things can make us more effective Christians. And we can still go through and, and be positive and confident in God's care. We don't have to worry about it. He's pruning, he's refining us, trying to soften our hearts a little bit so we can relate to our suffering fellows around us, all around us. So we can be more effective tools for the blessing of humanity. That's why Paul says, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, for when I am weak, I am strong. If we put ourselves in the place of the other person, trying to understand him or her, we don't have to worry about our words. Our words could be chosen to benefit people in the same boat we are in. A fountain of life would spring up in our souls and we would become like Christ. Our influence would be redemptive. We wa would watch for opportunities to bless and encourage other people. You do what Paul says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God, Christ, God in Christ forgave you. So watch your words. Watch how you say them. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, Paul said. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. We should consider our words as gifts. In fact, they are the most important gifts you can send. 
may mean far more than any material gift you can give. They can literally give faith, courage, hope, and quite possibly make the difference in helping a person who's about ready to give up.